Great, thank you. This is Caleb Dorfman, and on behalf of the Tuck Center for Private Equity and Venture Capital, I want to welcome you to this important keynote address with Brad Arnold, the SVP of Global Product Management for AICO. This is an important panel. Little can happen in agriculture without having farm equipment, and broader technological advances are improving precision agriculture equipment. These advances are improve, important in helping farmers improve yield, improve profitability, and solve some of the labor shortages farmers are experiencing. As one of the world's largest designers and manufacturers of farm equipment, we are excited to have AGCO's Brad Arnold. Moderating the discussion will be Chris Rhodes. Chris is the Director of Industry Partnerships and Project-Based Learning at the University of Georgia. Prior to taking on this role, he was at AGCO in a variety of management roles, and earlier in his career, he worked at John Deere and co-founded a biotech company. He holds an undergraduate degree from Dartmouth College and an MBA from Duke's Fuqua School. So Chris, I want to hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Brad, and thank you, Chris, for agreeing to moderate this. Thanks, Caleb. I'm excited to introduce Brad. Um, he, he's got a really interesting background that uh, you guys may want to ask questions about later, uh, depending on how many students are on the call. But uh, he went from being an accountant to being a strategic planning manager at Caterpillar to being the general manager of, a, I mean, an ag tech titan um, at Precision Planting to being a, a senior vice president at Agco. So really interesting path to get here. Um, Brad and I met when Agco acquired Precision Planting, uh, which Brad was running at the time. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Precision Planting, it, you know, was uh, unquestioningly the most innovative company in production ag, and uh, and Agco was really lucky to to be able to make that acquisition. Um, I ended up working for Brad uh, for I don't know a couple of years uh, before I came over here to the University of Georgia. Um, and I think the that kind of Brad's legacy at, at Agco is that more than anyone else, he brought a farmer first mentality to the company. Um, you know, it's really a a cultural shift over the last few years at Agco from kind of being product first to being farmer first. And he brought that over from precision planting. And I think it's been really important um, for, for Agco moving forward. Um, and so I think, you know, you're going to see that reflected in his talk today uh, as he talks about automation and agriculture. And, uh, and I think it's going to kind of bring that farmer first mentality for, for the big row crops, uh, big global company like Agco. Uh, and uh, I'm really interested to hear what he has to say. So, so Brad, thanks for, for joining us and uh, looking forward to hearing this. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. You know, it's always a little bit, uh, as I share my screen here, scary uh, to allow a former teammate um, employee to be able to introduce you. So I appreciate you keeping it clean and, and uh, not making me look silly. So thanks for that. You guys see my screen okay, Chris? <clears throat> Yes. Good. You good. can also see your speaker notes, though. So. Oh, they're not showing up. How do we? Uh, get the other side of it going. Now you'll see my files. How about now? Good. You can still see your speaker notes, but. Let's get their full full view. Sorry about this, guys. This worked the other day in our trial. Ah, uh, there we go. How about screen two? That'll work. There you go. Good, good. Hey, sorry for the technical glitch. It figures that I'm in technology, right? So uh, let me back up a little bit. Um, you know, these are always really, really fun opportunities for me. Um, you know, to rub shoulders, even if it is virtually, uh, with with highly innovative folks that want to challenge the status quo. Um, you know, ultimately, we've got a growing uh, population 
um, constraining, uh, you know, kind of environment to produce food in. And, um, you know, what I've seen over the last three days is I've watched a lot of other speakers, a lot of other presentations. I'm just blown away uh, by the amount of disruptive innovation uh, that I've seen. And so um, many of those uh, have been from <clears throat> plant-based protein perspectives, uh, as well as non-traditional, uh, kind of historically non-traditional means of food production. Uh, I want to talk a little bit today about, uh, you know, the traditional side of things. We still have about 2.3 billion acres of land that produces crops in, in these traditional ways. Uh, you know, maybe 12 to 13 different crops uh, that, that uh, are, are also part of our, you know, uh, food production, food security and sustainable, um, you know, sustainability initiatives. So, um, you know, I think it's a very important uh, element to include in, in uh, the event uh, this week. So I'm going to spend the next 10 to 15 minutes kind of walking you all through, you know, Agco's approach uh, to, to turning kind of an analog, you know, business to, to digital. Um, talk about some of the automation uh, that's driving increases in precision uh, capability. That, that increase in precision capability is driving increases in productivity. It's driving in, uh, in ways of reduction of waste, uh, obviously in, improvements of uh, you know, impacts on the environment as well as the sustainability of our land. And so that's, that's our ambition uh, at Agco. Um, we've just announced an Agvant strategy that really drives uh, uh, hard in that direction, um, as well as what Chris talked about this farmer first, this farmer first mentality. So I've shown this image uh, at the start of my presentations, um, probably for the last 12 years since I was at Precision Planning. This image is a picture of our founder uh, from Precision, Greg Souter, uh, sitting in the planter tractor cab um, as he gets ready to start. Uh, the planning season back in 2009. And uh, this image is still literally and figuratively true today. Uh, there are a ton of factors uh, that farmers are able to sense without certainty. Uh, and even if they do sense with certainty, lack the time and the means to respond uh, while performing a task with our equipment. Okay. And so uh, some of those factors relate to the performance of the machine as it accomplishes the task. Uh, some of those factors uh, involve the environmental conditions present while those tasks are being completed. And so uh, our mission of moving uh, from analog to digital really is about providing a farmer, uh, you know, the means to move from uncertainty to certainty. And I think we're all well aware that, that it's uncertainty that really drives farmers to make, you know, inefficient decisions. And so the greater certainty we can provide, the better decisions they're going to make uh, and the more profitable they're going to be and the more uh, improved outcome we're going to see. And so um, how do we do that, though, you know, as an industry? I'm a product management guy. Chris introduced you uh, to me as a, as a or introduced me to you as a product management leader. Um, you know, how, how do we accomplish this? You know, the, the model that Precision Planning has used, a company, again, that I that I came from, is a little different than most companies. Uh, you know, most companies listen to the voice of the customer first. Um, certainly, analyze the you know the landscape of comp competitors and benchmark uh, comp competing technologies. Um, we look in parallel industries and emerging technology uh, areas to see can we apply new technologies to to solve problems uh, within our particular application. Uh, but precision planning is always really focused on the farmer outcome. Farmers use machines to accomplish tasks. Those tasks have outcomes. Uh, and you know, really the, the only way to understand if that outcome was optimized is to get your boots dirty, get out on the field and measure the outcome. And so you can see in this picture, uh, Brad Stoller, one of our engineers from Precision Planning is uh, actually measuring stand evaluation after the planning path, planner pass. So he's looking at the standard deviation of spacing. He's looking at emergence. Uh, he's, he's looking for reasons for unemerged plants, documenting those electronically. Uh, you know, precision planning over the last eight, eight to nine years through tools like this, as well as larger, more scalable tools, has measured the emergence of over 100 million plants. And when we do this, we're able to identify where are the limitations in the outcome? Was it in the environment 
or was it in the machine's performance? And so this is really, when I talk about outcome measurement, this is really what I mean by, by that. So at ICO, we're, we're not just focusing on the planter pass like I just showed you. We're, we're looking at the entire crop cycle uh, and we're looking for problems uh, so that we can ultimately help farmers deliver a 20% improvement in net farm income uh, by reducing waste, by increasing yield through smart and sustainable solutions. So to do this, we've got to perform our own trials on farm using cooperators as well as our own, our own equipment and our own uh, uh, smart farms uh, to perform tasks around the crop cycle so we can gain understanding of where those problems are that limit the outcomes uh, from being optimal uh, on each task. It's this intense measurement process of both machine performance as well as understanding the environment that we can learn how to better control the one while better responding to the other. So bringing a farmer from uncertainty to certainty really is, is uh, again, the goal that we want so that we can accomplish that increase in, in farm income and ultimately drive value to them. So in order to accomplish this ambitious task, we've kind of mapped this. And uh, Chris, Chris is the author of this slide, so we love the fact that I included it. Um, you know, that map the progression essentially from connected machines all the way to smart machines. And so if we don't have machines connected, obviously that's kind of, you know, pillar one. We've got to have information flowing from machines uh, into the cloud so that we've got, you know, a, a great access and great understanding of, of uh, you know, what's going on during the task. Um, once we've got machines connected, we've got to take our understanding of the outcomes uh, and that's going to give us insight into what aspects of the environment as well as the machine performance that we need to measure. Uh, as we measure those attributes, uh, we'll allow farmers to visualize those while they're performing the task. This will give them the opportunity or ability to make adjustments manually uh, during the task to improve the outcome real time. And then ultimately, that visualization, when we apply analytics to it, uh, to that sensed information, and we can then provide insights uh, and even advice uh, to, uh, to farmers. Um, and then ultimately, once we're confident that those measurements are accurate and we understand how to uh, adjust to respond to what we're sensing, now we turn that into closed loop control, uh, which leads to these full uh, smart machines uh, that, that I'm gonna show you a quick example of here in a minute. You can see the uh, device on the left side of this slide. Uh, it's a smart firmer. Um, the display there in the middle is, is essentially the planter monitor or the computer uh, that's, that's uh, in the cab with the tractor uh, connected to the planter. And this obviously is a furrow. Uh, you can see a few seeds dropped in the furrow there. Um, what that smart firmer is doing, in addition to pressing down on the seeds to make sure there's good seed to soil contact, that uh, seeds are in moisture and there's good emergence. It's providing a mechanical, you know, uh, improved mechanical outcome. But it's also got a series of optical sensors on it, as well as a thermo sensor, so that we can actually measure organic matter, CECs, seed oil available moisture, residue, uh, soil temperature, all real time in the furrow. This could be put on one row. It could be put on every row of the planter. Um, so that we can measure all that real time. And with that information, uh, particularly organic matter, we can now adjust seeding rates dynamically. Um, if you think about uh, high organic matter um, soil, we, we would likely, in corn or soybeans, we would likely wanna increase the density of, of seeding rates um, so that we can take advantage of that higher production capacity within the soil. If it's lower organic matter, we would want to reduce uh, the amount of seed de seeding density um, so that we would lower uh, the, the population because there's less nutrients available in that area. Um, so we can dynamically make sure that we precisely placed uh, the right amount of seeds uh, in the right soil to create the greatest outcome. Likewise, we can also adjust hybrids uh, in that same example of, of high productivity soil, high organic matter soil, we could place an offensive hybrid uh, if I have the capability of multi-hybrid uh, 
planting. And I could place a, an offensive hybrid that has the potential to yield more um, because of that uh, additional uh, access to nutrients. And likewise, plant a defensive hybrid in lower organic matter soils uh, to ensure that you know, I'm not overpopulating those areas as well. So fertility really runs in the same way. Um, and then additionally, with moisture uh, that's being sensed uh, by Smart Firmer, we can now actually adjust the planting depth too to ensure that we're always planting within moisture um, so that the seed has uh, enough moisture to, to germinate quickly and consistently uh, and, and get uh, each plant out of the furrow at the same time. So this, this really is probably one of the best examples of a single sensor uh, that's that's able to, to react uh, to the environment and optimize the outcome uh, of, of four functions on the planter uh, at one time. So for farmers to win uh, in smart farming, um, you know, I've, I've shown you one example of one pass, but we've got to be able to automate all functions um, that have dynamic performance influencers on machines all the way around the crop cycle. Okay, so People routinely will ask us, uh, you know, when will robots start to manage the farm for us? And um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna listen later today to, to some great uh, pioneers in in robotics. Uh, Egino is gonna come and talk from Bear Flag. I know Egino well. Um, you know, some some great advancements being made there. But the reality is, there are so many tasks controlled by the analog sensors within the farmer's brain today. Uh, that we've really got a couple decades to go to convert those all to digital. Um, and so our approach uh, is ICO. Uh, we really believe we've got to start one crop, one tool, one limiting performance factor at a time on that tool, measure it, visualize it, ultimately control it, and then move on to the next one, and then on to the next one, and on to the next one. Um, and each one of those problems that we solve for a farmer is going to add value to their operation. It's going to have uh, so a profit impact for them. It's likely going to have a, a better environmental impact uh, for, for society as well as better sustainability of the land because we're able to move the farmer again from uncertainty to certainty in the decisions that they're making. So uh, again, this is uh, our approach. I wanted to spend just a few minutes um, you know, kind of giving you guys some insight into that uh, before uh, we dive into some Q and A. So let's stop sharing before you see the infinity view, and I'll come back to y'all. Hey, Chris. Hi. Sorry, it took me a little bit of, to get off of mute there. Uh, thanks for that uh, talk. Um, Caleb, I'm not sure how to see the questions that the, the audience might be asking. So um, while we get that set up, I'll, I'll just kind of ask a couple of questions here. Yeah, Brad. yeah, Chris, it's like, and everyone in the audience, if you have a question, you can click on the ask a question uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And Chris, that will pop out of the we'll okay, good. one or two. So, yep. So feel free to put in questions you have in the bottom. Great. So uh, I think I'll start. This is a, a business school function. So I, I want to start by talking about margin. And I appreciate the credit you gave me for the pyramid, um, moving up the pyramid from connectivity to smart. Uh, the original version of that I know had dollar signs on it. And so uh, I just wanted you to uh, just comment on kind of what you viewed as the additional margin opportunities that come from moving up the pyramid. Yeah, no, that's great. You know, when you think about um, you know, first, I'll kind of back up a little bit. Um, there were 10 years ago, nine, nine, 10 years ago, there were a number of companies, number of startups that felt like um, agronomic data was valuable, right? That there was a way to monetize that. And, and uh, there's a lot of business models created around that. Um, you know, I happened to, through the acquisition of Precision Planning by Monsanto, um, I became part of the Climate Corporation after the Climate Corp was acquired by Monsanto. And David Friedberg uh, told me, you know, the first time I met him, that data was ubiquitous, right? <laughs> that nobody really in the end is going to be willing to pay for data, but data is vital, um, you know. And so the, the value of connectivity, the value of data, um, it does not have a lot of inherent value that you can point to that causes a farmer to want to pay for the service, pay for the equipment. Um, but it enables everything. That's why I think, you know, Chris, you, you obviously developed the pyramid in, in such a way. But as we get from, you know, uh, 
data collection to visualization, and now I can start to make you know kind of retroactive decisions. Um, obviously, it, it can't impact the the here and now, but it can impact my future. Um, you know, and so as we go from visualization that allows a farmer to, to change the behavior, change the task, um, you know, that has some value. But boy, as we move up to, you know, smart, as I said, where we have closed loop control, where we're sensing and reacting at the same time, um, the, the, the value to the farmer is significant because there's no latency in, in uh, you know, the, the, the performance of the task. And, and likewise, as a company, not only are we creating value for the, for the farmer, for the company, um, those products, sensors, as well as the ability to actuate, um, you know, in, in a robotic way or automated way, has significant value versus the chassis itself. That's really just the carrier of the, the intelligence of the machine. So, um, you know, to Agco and to the customer, that pyramid, you know, kind of reigns true. Right. Well, another question I have, I, you mentioned uh, the boots getting dirty, and, and I've actually brought that over to, to UGA um, as well. I think it's a, a great concept. And as we think about disruptive innovation and where some of that's coming from and, and the types of folks that are coming into the industry to, to create that disruptive innovation, today it's roboticists, it's you know, data um, analysts, it's software engineers, um, and so we're seeing true disruption coming from kind of non-ag places, uh, but there's still room and, and, a, and a necessity for, for boots getting dirty. So I thought maybe you could expand on that notion a little bit for, for this audience as we think about um, what it means to really serve the farmer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's a couple dimensions to that. Um, you know, far farmers are inherently... Uh, scientists, um, they they do trial and error every, every year. Right now, farmers in the Midwest are, are putting plots in to learn about hybrids. They're putting plots in to learn about different technology that they may want to invest in um, to see, it, you know, is there an ROI? Um, and likewise, farmers, you know, to some degree want to see that people understand the, the, the burden they're under, um, that they recognize that what happens in the lab doesn't actually happen in the field. And I actually, I actually think I heard, um, you know, I, I think it was uh, one of the, one of the folks on Tuesday talk about that mistake that they had made. I've, I've forgotten. I think it was the egg, um, the egg uh, uh, innovator, um, you know, that, that what happens in the lab doesn't necessarily replicate itself in the field. And so the ability to, to spend significantly more time, testing whatever hypothesis or minimum lovable solution you have in the field to see the outcome, um, you know, the, the, the more likely you're going to have something that's successful. And likewise, the more believable it's going to be to the, to the farmer, because there's an inherent skepticism, I think, to, uh, you know, to some of the disruptive innovations um, that, that have come through in the last five to 10 years where claims have been made that haven't been delivered and farmers are a little skeptical today, I think. So, yeah. great, good. Well, I, you know, I, kind of transitioning from that to, to a similar topic, um, you know, there's a lot of disruptive technology that's coming out of California, for instance. And, you know, the crops around Silicon Valley are specialty crops. They're, you know, they're very labor intensive. And, and you see a lot of solutions coming from that part of the world that are about labor. Um, but you alluded earlier to the fact that there's about 10 crops grown around the world that account for 2.3 billion acres. That's, a, that's about two thirds of the total uh, cropland in the world is 10 staple crops like corn, soy, wheat, millet, um, things that are broad acre and, and require big machines. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you had any comments on kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, is that really what this 2.3 billion acres that you think about every day is, is looking for? You broke up in the middle of that. Can you finish the last part of your question? Uh, you know, I know you, you spend most of your day thinking about that 2.3 billion acres. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering kind of where the labor problems or labor challenges that a lot of solutions are, are trying to solve for fit into that 
that mix when you're thinking about these broad acre crops? Yeah, no, it, you know, we, we, um, we invite, we, we spend a lot of time with customers and, and our, our customers in California uh, that are in, in veggies and specialty crop are, are clamoring for autonomy, right? They're asking us, please, you know, laborers, if, if we can find it, we can't afford it. Um, you know, we just in, uh, had a conversation with several farmers as a leadership team in uh, from Tasmania uh, a month ago. And likewise, they, they farm about um, uh, 40,000 acres of uh, veggies. And again, in Tasmania, labor is too expensive. They're looking for automation. Um, you know, and so those are problems that are necessary to solve, but in specialty crop, the revenue per acre is different than in the broad acres you're talking about. And so the, the investment and cost structure that, that farmers have uh, available of corn, soy, broad acre uh, environments is, you know, single digits to tens to $20 per acre of discretionary money to throw it at technology, not, you know, $100, $200. And that's where, you know, most of the innovation that's coming in the area of robotics is coming in specialty crops because it can add value to it. Um, you know, and I think as we, you know, are able to leverage those innovations and bring them over to broad acre and lower the cost structure, obviously leverage them over the 2.3 billion acres, um, you know, over the next, you know, uh, 5, 10, 15 years, you know, those have become a lot more relevant. Um, but, you know, today in, in, in the Midwest, uh, most farmers um, have enough equipment uh, that, that labor is not the same problem that it is in California, as an example. Yeah. Good. Well, let's talk a, a minute about um, kind of all the different types of technology that are out there and how they connect together or don't connect together uh, and what Agco's kind of position on all of that um, spaghetti mess is. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I talked about connectivity, right? Connectivity is, is uh, critical. We can get data um, that, that we've collected off of off of machines into the cloud um, those you know that, that information allows a farmer with their trusted advisor uh, to make better decisions in the next task right next part of the crop cycle in the next season um, but only to the extent that it's portable right and, and able to be integrated and and uh, you know Agco has kind of taken the approach we're, we're not an FMAS solution. Um, you know, we, we want to make that's what an FMIS is yeah. farm management information system. We, you know, there's a lot of great software developers out there. Um, you know, a lot of input providers are creating those kind of solutions. And so we believe our job is to get um, as much data collected during a task as possible, make that available um, through our partners like um, AGI in, in North America or DKE, which we're a founder of in, in uh, Europe, uh, that allows for our data to go to the cloud, um, be uh, transferred to you know whatever FMIS system the farmer wants to use so that they and their agronomists can make those decisions for that next pass or that next season, um, you know, uh, in terms of prescriptions or, or other decisions that they need to make, so. Great. All right. Well, Brad, I just realized how to actually see the questions. So um, we, we've got some piled up here. So I, I'll ask them in the order that I see them here. So um, Amar James is asking what the rate of adoption of precision ag is. For example, how long will it take before at least 50 percent of U.S. farmers are using at least one precision ag tool or application? Well, yeah, I think everybody wonders, you know, what degree do we call precision ag? I would say uh, today about 85% of farmers over 500 acres are using guidance systems today. Okay, that's the very first precision ag solution. Um, roughly that same percentage have uh, yield monitors today. That's another precision ag solution. So we're well above uh, uh, the 50% the mark that you mentioned. However, you know, the adoption of variable rate technology uh, where you're actually doing what I described as changing the seeding rates or changing the fertility rates, um, so that you're only feeding the crop what it needs at uh, each each particular part of the field. Those technologies would probably be down in the 40 percent, 35 to 40 percent range. Um, you know, as an example. Yeah. Good. Um, 
Next question. Uh, this is an interesting one. So, uh, I think you'll like this one. What, what is your approach to innovation? Do you work with startups frequently or is it mostly internally driven? That's Daniel Pacharka asking that question. Hey, Daniel, thanks. You know, that's a really hard one. I aspire to leverage partners um, big time. Uh, what we find is it's very, always very challenging. Um, you know, and, and you know, most companies like Agco uh, and larger, uh, you know, people kind of would criticize and say they have a not invented here mentality. Um, you know, we have a lot of really smart engineers um, that, that believe if given the chance, given the funding, they could solve any problem too. <laughs> um, every company has that, every engineer has that mindset. Uh, but, but when it comes down to it, um, we are very open to partnership and, and, and want to partner, but, but probably only one out of 10 do we actually end up partnering with just because of, it, it always has to be a win-win, right? And that's the toughest thing is the direction, and, and I came from a startup, right? And so does the direction that the startup's headed match with the direction that the OEM or the, you know, the acquiring company or partnering company wants to go. And, and if I'm a startup today and you're listening, that, that matters. You may think that the exit is what matters, you know, to, to your people, to your legacy, to, to ultimately creating value for a farmer. Um, it really matters that your partner is moving in the same direction as aspires to take what you've created and solve the problem that you're passionate about, uh, ultimately helping a farmer. Um, so, uh, again, maybe that's a little bit of a, a advice for folks. I know there's some, some startup folks out there, so. Yep. Uh, Christian Ng has a, an interesting question that I always like like to hear answers to. You know, we're in an industry that globally is still at one end um, run by animal power and at the other end is, you know, utilizing satellites. So uh, her question is, how do you see this technology being adopted in emerging markets? And do you have a timeline for this? Boy, we have a we have a passion for it. I'll say it that way. We have a a, a learning farm um, in Zambia, uh, the Martin Rieschenhagen Future Farm. Um, Martin was our uh, former chairman. He just retired at the end of the year, and we we uh, named the farm after him as a as a uh, tribute to his legacy here at uh, at Agco. Um, and and at that farm, we take the local practices um, and you know, uh, put plots in to show the local practices and, and the outcomes of, of the local practices. We'll put in um, some some improved, uh, you know, practices with using some current agco technology as an example. And then we'll actually bring over precision planting and some higher, you know, capability um, um, equipment and put plots in next to it, just so that the local uh, people can see the difference. And, um, you know, ultimately, you know, you're, uh, to the heart of your question, when can we see impact? Uh, you know, that, that, that's probably much more of an economic question uh, than an uh, ag technology question. Um, you know, the capability of the, uh, the operators uh, along with the ability to, to afford the equipment, those kind of things, um, all, all is gonna make a, a difference there. But um, certainly something that we're trying to, to first win with education over. Yeah. I think uh, just a quick follow up question to that is, you know, if you look at the history of phones in Africa, they basically just skipped landlines. They went from no phones to cell phones and from cell phones to smartphones. Do you think that there's a kind of a path forward like that in um, some of the more emerging ag economies uh, for, for ag tech? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's very possible. Um, you know, today, and, and this is probably more of a function of our distribution network than, than anything, but today uh, we don't have a real mature distribution network in Africa um, to, be, to, to have enough visibility to have what that adoption curve will look like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question from Brandon Kuhn is, what is the regulatory outlook for operators in your space? And do you think it's more likely to enhance or challenge your mission? Well, regulation is a broad question. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my mind immediately goes to nitrogen use. Um, you know, my mind goes to you know what's possible with autonomy as an example. Um, you know, and I think I think what we're going to find is uh, 
you know, regulation for from nitrogen specifically is going to continue to get uh, tighter and more controlled. And so our approach to that is that we've got to find better ways to apply nitrogen, um, like through banding of nitrogen, um, you know, with the planter pass as an example, uh, so that, you know, there's less um, NOx emissions because what gets put on gets used by the plant immediately and, and not uh, volatilized or whatever. So, um, you know, I think those those are areas that we're focused on from an innovation perspective, as well as things like drift control and and other things with our spray technology too that we're that we're trying to innovate around so that we, you know, are, are uh, really living up to our aspiration of being a, a, a sustainable company. Good. The, the, the next two questions are related, so I'm going to ask them together. Um, the, the first one's from George Roach, and the second one's from Skylar Dalton. Uh, George writes, hi, Brad. I was curious if you had any thoughts on smaller swarm tractors and their potential in the future of precision ag. And then Skylar's question is, what technologies could put tractors as we know them at risk of dis disruption? So I think those are related. Yes, yes and yes, right? <laughs> Um, so Agco actually has a pilot um, swarm approach. Uh, it's, a, it's a little robot called Zaver. Um, we actually launched that uh, publicly in 2017 at Agrotechnica in Germany. And at the time it was a seeder, it was a planter. Um, and you know, certainly uh, that, that swarm approach is uh, a very viable disruptor. Um, you know, there, there are just so many things um, as, and we've learned just full transparency with robots, anything that's ground engaging, the reason why machines are big is because it takes weight. <laughs> um, you know, and so, so there are some, you know, some physics that, that will limit some of the tasks from being done effectively with small swarms. Um, but, but somewhere in that medium size, you know, say, say 10 to 20 foot type uh, toolbar or working with is very, very viable. Uh, and again, Agco is is very active in investing in, in how we can solve for that. A little device like Zaber is an example. I think the, the, the best approach that we can take with that, um, you know, really, if you think about a farmer, the things that they hate to do the most is get in a standing crop in July and August and scout. Uh, and the things that they need to do the most is get into a standing crop in July and August and scout. And so, you know, the, the I know there's a number of, there's a startup at, out of the University of Illinois that's focused on this, uh, but but scouting robots, uh, I think have a immediate use case, can add immediate value, um, low cost, and really give a, give a farmer a better understanding in season, you know, when there's uh, disease and, and pest pressure that needs to be taken care of. So. Um, those are those are kind of what I would say is the first you know the first use cases that we'll see in in uh, high adoption. Great. Uh, I don't see any other questions from the audience, so I'm I'm going to ask one and give folks a, another couple minutes here. Um, you know, when I got into precision ag hard in 2014, uh, it was a kind of a, a high tide for drones. Uh, and I've seen, you know, China has actually been really developing a lot of ag drone applications uh, over that time. But you, you saw a real drop off for a while. It seems like they're coming back. Uh, do you have thoughts on uh, aerial drones and how they fit with uh, precision ag? Yeah, I'll tell you what. The uh, drones themselves are aircrafts and anybody creating a solution on an aircraft has to essentially pay aircraft insurance. So the value that you need to create with that device, um, you know, it's it's one thing to create a proof of concept. It's another thing to actually put one in the air uh, and, and pay the liability costs for it because it does have the potential to, to do damage. So you know, right now, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with that tension of, I know that we actually have several projects that we've launched and then paused um, because of, of those very issues. So. Um, you know, that's, a, I think, a, a bridge that's going to have to be crossed from a regulatory, you know, economic perspective for, for us to see real value in drones. Yeah. And that leads to, to the next question. Uh, it, you know, the argument for drones now is Amazon's putting tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions 
into figuring out how to use a drone fleet for their work. Mm -hmm. And that might bleed over into to, uh, to agriculture. You know, any thoughts about, you know, either that for drones or you look at Tesla with auto driving machines. I mean, how, how does technology in other spaces fit into to the equation for Agco? No, that that's great. I, you know, I think, um, let, let me back up and, and just reaffirm if I can get, if I can get something over a crop, again, I, I use the example of a, of a robot in the crop, but if I could get something over a crop, um, understand biomass, understand biomass changes, um, during the growing season, that has, that has huge value. And, you know, to, to say that if Amazon had, you know, drones that were delivering packages and recording <laughs> or, or whatever, and again, this brings up the idea of data portability, um, you know, gosh, absolutely. You know, those are, those are things that, that you can get multiple use, you know, mul multiple purposes out of and, and add, add value. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that exactly hits your question, but. Good. All right. Last chance for anybody else to ask a question. Chris, I think we probably have time for one more question. Well, I've run out of questions, Caleb. <laughs> so I've got one question for you, Brad. All right. Caleb. What is the biggest game changing technology that you're looking at right now, which you think might be commercialized in the next five years that really we aren't talking about enough? I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's so many things, Caleb. Um, you know, I just think about I just think about the opportunity in um, again. We're, we're talking about analog to digital. In in uh, green harvesting is an example. Hay and forage. There are so many manual processes that farmers employ today that um, just bringing RFID technology uh, to uh, track bales, when bales are produced, uh, when, um, where they're stored, how much uh, relative feed value they have, um, that, that allows a farmer to monetize a bale of hay much differently than they do today. Um, you know, so honestly, I, I don't mean to be trite, but there, there are so many areas where um, you know, we can bring uh, digital technologies to bear in agriculture and, and help a farmer make that next step. Again, that's why I use that 20% farm income as a as our aspiration because there are just so many so many little areas that we can we can make improvements. Fantastic. Well, Chris, thank you very much for moderating. I think that was a great set of questions. Brad, thank you very much for joining us today. It definitely seems that Agco is making a lot of advances. And I think that I'm definitely gonna to continue to follow the new products, the new technologies and good luck on uh, achieving that 20% target because that would definitely be good for all of the farmers out there. So thank you very much. And I invite you to join us for our next pal panel on data and analytics throughout the value chain. Thank you very much. Great, thanks guys. Thank